Thank you very much. I ask you to turn to John's Gospel on chapter number six, the Gospel of John and chapter number six. Begin reading at verse number 30, John chapter six, verse number 30. They said, therefore unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and gives life unto the world. Verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. Look down at verse number 38. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And we have the Jews murmuring over that. And verse number 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers that eat manna in the wilderness are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give, I will give for the life of the world. Verse 53, Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood at the eternal life. I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers that eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. And we do trust God will bless thee reading of his word to all of us who are here. Now, just in the event that there may be one or two who are not with us last week, we're looking at the three occasions in the Gospel of John when from the seven different I am statements made by the Lord Jesus, there are three of them in which he qualifies it by adding the expression true. He is the true light. He is the true bread and he is the true vine. As the true light, he brings revelation and with it salvation. As the true bread, he brings refreshment and with it, he brings satisfaction. And next week in the will of the Lord, we'll see that as the true vine, he brings sanctification and the reproduction of the life of Christ in each one of us by divine grace. As you think about bread, you're very, very conscious that it is basic to life. Lord Jesus used one of the most obvious, most blatant examples of something that sustains life. I am the bread of life. It is basic to all of life. The Lord Jesus as well realized that here is something that is so available. It's broad in its availability, available in every culture, in every country. There's something that answers to bread that every group of people throughout the world would readily understand when he refers to himself as bread. Here's something so very, very necessary in every way. The Lord Jesus here refers to himself again as the true bread. And again, it's not the idea that all that before him was false. It's rather the idea he's the ultimate. Everything prior to him was building up to this point, was pointing forward to this point when he as the true bread would come and provide not merely sustenance for day-to-day -day life, but would provide that which was necessary for eternal life. I want you to think first of the context in which this statement occurs. Back in the beginning of chapter six, we are reminded in verse number four that Passover was nigh at hand. It was Passover season. Then you have the Lord Jesus Christ following that occasion when he fed the 5,000, the very next event is he walks upon the water. And if you think of that, you think about the children of Israel and the Passover night 
and leaving Egypt, and they walk through the water. But the Lord Jesus Christ, in contrast, walks on the water to come to his disciples. And when the, when the Israelites came into the wilderness, one of the first things they encountered was the manna and the bread. And so we have the background of Passover and Exodus and the manna brought before us as part of the context of this chapter and which the Lord Jesus Christ will use in a large way as the background for his discussion with the Jews of his day. But I think there is another background that we have to consider as well that is even broader and perhaps more basic. Genesis chapter 3, when the, with the fall of Adam, is the first mention of bread. Here is another mention of bread. So Genesis 3 is the first mention of bread. Here we have the true bread that has come into the world. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, they ate and they died. Here in John chapter 6, the Lord Jesus reverses the order and it is eating and living. So you're getting something of the intent of this chapter that the Lord Jesus is reversing everything that came into the world through Adam by the bread of life. It's another interesting study, and I'll just mention this for those who wish to follow it out. But in John's gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ replaces everything. In John chapter one, you recall, he tabernacled amongst men. So he replaces the tabernacle. In John chapter two, he refers to his body as a, a temple. He replaces the temple. In John chapter three, he replaces the teacher, Nicodemus. And then he goes on to replace the types and the traditions of the nation. Here he is replacing one of the types in the manna. So in Genesis, we have bread for the first time. Here in John chapter 6, we have the ultimate bread that has come into the world. In John, in Genesis, we have eating and dying. In John 6, we have eating and living. In Genesis chapter 3, they were going to eat bread in the sweat of their brow until they returned to the dust. In John chapter 6, they were going to re eat bread, and we have resurrection in view, overcoming what sin brought in uh, of death. In Genesis chapter 3, they had to labor for their bread. In the sweat of his brow, he would toil and he would struggle to bring forth bread. Here in John chapter 6, it is freely given. It's the bread the Father gives. It's his life he will give for the life of the world. So it is, it is absolutely without cost. In Genesis chapter 3, bread is linked with sorrow. Bread is linked with a curse. Here in Genesis, in John chapter 6, bread is linked with satisfaction and bread is linked with blessing. And in finally, in Genesis chapter 3, bread is linked with the result of a man who asserted his own will against the will of God. Disobedience. Here in John chapter 6, the Lord Jesus makes clear that he has come to do the will of his Father, which is in heaven. Most of you have noticed that in John chapter 4 and in John chapter 5 and in John chapter 6, there are statements the Lord Jesus Christ makes about doing the will of God. In John chapter 4, recall when the disciples came and wanted them to eat, he could tell them that his meat was to do the will of him that had sent him. In John chapter 5, he makes clear that he didn't seek his own will, but he sought the will of of the Father which sent him. Here in John chapter 6, again, he mentions that he came down from heaven. His whole purpose in coming was not to do his own will, but the will of him that sent him. So in a very, very real way, John chapter 6 is standing in stark contrast with Genesis chapter 3. Everything that Adam brought into the world as a result of sin, sorrow, death, the curse, all that he brought in, this bread from heaven is going to reverse. We eat and we live. We have the promise of resurrection life. We have the promise of satisfaction. We are blessed. We are brought into the circle of God's favor. And we see the great contrast in effect between these two chapters. 
Having said that, just look for a few moments for our own personal enjoyment. This perhaps is not so much practical, although there will be some things here that are practical. Not so much practical, just something for us to enjoy of all that we have in, in the Lord Jesus. I want you to think, first of all, of the claims of Christ. Claim number one is that he possesses life inherently. It is his because of who he is. He is the living bread as well as the life-giving bread. As the living bread, he is making a claim to have life inherently and essentially and eternally all within himself. We read last week in John chapter 1, in him was life. And the sense of that word is the very same that began in John 1 and 1. In the beginning was an imperfect tense going all the way back as far as you can go. In him was life. It was his eternally, his inherently, and as such as a claim to the deity. But as such as well, he has come to give life. And he is reminding us that only life can produce life. And as we find, he will have to do it by his own death. He came down from heaven. He came down. It's as though the author has come to give us the interpretation and the understanding of the book. Or if you will, the, the manufacturer has come and has opened up the instruction manual about how life should be lived. And how life can be pleasing and, and satisfying. He came and he laid down his life. And he tells us here, he was the one who possesses life in himself. Under eyes, all his, and that which he willingly came to give. He possesses inherent life. But of course, wonderfully revealed in this chapter is that he provides eternal life. As the living bread. As the true bread, he provides life to the world. As you go through this chapter, the Lord Jesus Christ says on seven occasions that he came down from heaven. He has touched down on planet Earth for the great purpose of providing eternal life for each one of us. You'll notice that he says that he, the bread that he gives is his flesh. Which he gives for the life of the world. I find that interesting. He does not say his body. That is language that is reserved for the upper room and the institution of the Lord's Supper. Here, when it comes to our having eternal life, he is giving his flesh. Now go back to chapter one. The word became flesh. True humanity, a man living amongst us, he partook of flesh and blood. And moved here, and that very life that he that he enjoyed and that visited earth, that life was the life that he laid down that we might have life. He is able to communicate life, and he is able to provide us with eternal life. If you think of it, and you'll have to go back over this yourself, each of the great seven I am titles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are proofs of his deity. We mentioned last week that when Moses turned aside to see the burning bush, God revealed himself as the I am that I am. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, he further revealed in that title the I am all the fullness and all the sufficiency of his person. Not just what he is inherently as the the living bread as the true bread, as the true light. But all that he is able to do as the good shepherd, as the way, the truth, and the light, as the resurrection and the light, as the vine, as, and all of these ways in which he is considered, it reveals to us his fullness, the sufficiency of his person, the greatness of his work. All of that is contained in these, these great I am titles of Lord Jesus Christ. He possesses life. He has provided us with eternal life as a result of the life that he laid down and that we partake, we eat and live. Now, it's often pointed out, and I'll just do it again for the sake of young believers, that in verse number 55, the Lord Jesus 
oh, sorry, verse number 53, the Lord Jesus Christ says, except we eat the flesh. That's a one-time thing. That's what we do when we get saved. Now, the reason the Lord Jesus Christ uses that language of eating and drinking is because when you eat and drink, you make something your own. That's an obvious fact, right? Something sitting on the table as delicious as it may appear, as nutritious as it may look, as sustaining, as life-sustaining as it might be, until you eat, until you take it, it's not really yours. And so he is saying here, he is going to provide through the giving of his body, the shedding of his blood, the giving of his flesh, the shedding of his blood. He is going to provide the means by which people can eat and live. And when they do, all that sin and Satan brought into the world through Adam will all be changed. We will now eat and we will live. So in verse number 53, it is a one-time event. That's what you did when you got saved. That's what I did. We weren't thinking of that, but when we accepted Christ, so the value of his work, we literally ate. Many of the words that John uses for this event, believing, trusting, accepting, coming, going through the door, all of those are expressions John uses that gathers together in his gospel to tell us of the great truth of salvation. But when you come now to verse number 56, it is not a one-time thing. Here is something we do for the remainder of our spiritual lives. We continue to eat and we continue to drink. And what that means is here is one that provides what is a profitable and enjoyable life. Enjoying Christ through our, our life here upon earth. We need to feed upon Christ continually. The initial eating that occurs at Conversions Day is only the beginning. We continue to appropriate Christ in our lives for every step of life's journey, for all of its trials, for all of its difficulties. So I want to just take uh, a few minutes to take a diversion for the sake of younger believers and talk to you about feeding upon the word of God day by day in your life. The first thing to recognize is, in keeping with what we read here in verse 56, this must be a priority. I have to realize that it's not enough just to possess eternal life. God's intention is for that life to grow and to be a satisfying life and to be a life that is marked by a continual feeding. So it has to be a priority in my life. You recall when it came to gathering the manna, they had to gather it early, both in terms of the time of the day, they had to eat what they gathered, and they had to gather according to their appetites. So let me just suggest gathering it early, both in terms of the time of the day and the time of your life. <clears throat> Getting to your Bible when you are a young person is invaluable. I can tell you that even though I thought I would have lots of time as I got older for Bible study, two things occur. Life seems to get busier, and your mind seems to get less able to take it all in. And so what you learn at, in your young Christian life is vital and is important. So gathering it early, both in terms of the time of day, when your mind is fresh, and in the years of your life when your mind is at its freshest and at its best. So make it a priority, number one. Number two, make it your practice. Do it every day. Don't leave it for when you find time. Don't leave it for when you're not busy. Don't leave it for when school is done. You must give yourself to, to, to your Bible on a daily basis. Just like the Israelites had to gather daily, you and I will have to come to the word of God every day. We are not strong enough to face all that life throws at us without something from the word of God on a daily basis. Read your Bible with patience. It takes years of study, years of diligent, devoted study to the word of God to begin to really have a grasp for the breadth and depth of the scripture, to see it in all of its fullness, how it all fits together so perfectly by the great design of the great designer. So come to it with patience. Come to it as well 
with a positive mindset. <clears throat> Come to your Bible with the awareness that God wishes to speak to me, wishes to make himself known to me, and he desires to open the word of God to my understanding. That doesn't mean you'll get something every single time. But if you come with a positive approach, confidence in God, and linked with that would be a prayerful attitude, looking to God to open your eyes to behold wondrous things out of his law. I think as a young Christian, I had a, a very warped concept, and that is that the Christian life was like a rat maze. That somehow you had to find your way through it. And if you didn't, you were going to really lose out. And uh, God was trying to make it as hard as he could to get through safely and to get to the other end. But really, God wants to reveal truth to you in his word. He wants you to feed upon Christ. So coming to it positive, coming to it prayerfully, and coming to it recognizing it is going to take painstaking labor to reap from the word of God. Just been studying a bit. By a man named Ezra. When you read about him in Ezra chapter 7, he had set his heart to understand the words, not just the word of the Lord, but the words, the very words themselves. He was someone who said he's the first man who got involved with word study. And so understanding the words the Spirit of God has used to communicate his message. And fortunately, today we have so many helps. Whether you want to think about a Vines or a Wilson's Old Testament or the online resources, we have so many resources available to understand the very words of Scripture. And so we are reminded here of the need then to continually feed upon the Word of God. Coming, feeding upon His Word, we will learn what He values. We will learn what He desires for us. We will be satisfied with His approval. And not men's. It's interesting as well to think, and I don't think it's going beyond scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ referred to himself as the bread of God. Could it be that in that title, there's just not the, the idea that God is the source of the bread, but this is bread that God himself has fed upon for all eternity. One of the great reasons that God has provided, well, one of the great reasons God has brought humanity into being and has gone to the great expense and difficult trouble of bringing about salvation is not that God needed something, whether somehow heaven would not have been absolutely content with just Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together. But I think one of the reasons, and you can give me your own thinking on it if you ever wish to. God enjoyed his son so much. He wanted others to enjoy what he's been enjoying eternally. God has been feasting upon his son and all that his son is. And God wanted us to enjoy that as well. So he is the bread of God. He is the living bread. He is the true bread. He is the life-giving bread. He is all of that. And then, as well, in this chapter, in a very unique way, four times over, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of raising him up at the last day. So I have <coughs> pondered that, wondered why the Lord Jesus Christ introduces that here in this chapter as something that is linked with him being the bread of life. Four times over, he speaks of his ability to raise it up, raise him up, raise them up again at the last day. Could I suggest that life in all of its fullness will only be known when we are in resurrected bodies in his presence eternally? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in one of the References that Paul makes to the Lord's coming. He says in verse number 10, who died for us and rose again, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. I think that we'll, we will actually find that we really have never lived as God intends us to live. That life in all of its fullness 
all of the hindrances, all of the restrictions, all of the limitations that are linked with these natural bodies that are marked by corruption and dishonor and humiliation, all of that will be gone. And life as God intends us to enjoy will be known when our bodies are raised and we are glorified together with him. We will live together with him like we have never lived before. I'll just mention you can go back over the chapter four times in this chapter. The Lord Jesus Christ says, verily, verily. 24 times in the Gospel of John, is it? Or, and uh, here are four of them, just in one chapter. Verily, verily. As though this is absolutely guaranteed and certain. So just uh, it, as a way of summarizing. As the true bread be sufficient for the world and not just for a nation. Not just for 40 years, he will be our bread forever. There will be nothing that we will ever feed upon for eternity that will not be linked with Christ. Just as he is God's light for revelation eternally, so he is God's food upon which we will feed for all eternity. He is the bread of God. He is the bread which has come down from heaven. He is the living bread, but he is the true bread, the ultimate bread that God has for us to enjoy, to feed upon day by day, and ultimately for all eternity. And so we should be coming to this book, looking to God to open our eyes to appreciate more and more of Christ, feeding upon him, finding our strength for Christian living in him from him and enjoying him as God intends us to enjoy all that we have in him. So we trust God will bless his word and in the will of God next week we'll consider John chapter 15 or Jesus as the true vine. Thank you very much.